Hello scholars, marketing strategy scholars, Dr. Williams back with the next chapter in our video lecture series, chapter two, corporate strategy decisions and their marketing implications. Possibly the most boring title of any chapter of any textbook you've ever seen, but the topic's not that boring. So with that said, I'll go and try to prove myself right, and we will move along. The firm's mission. How many people know what the mission statement of the School of Business is? I'm going to guess, not many. But do you know this located on, or should be, uh, located on every syllabus that you have for every course you take? It is, but is it really catchy and memorable? Obviously not, if you don't know where it's located or what it is. But most organizations have a mission statement that describes what they're about, or more specifically, what's the business? Who are our customers? What kind of value do we provide? To these customers and not all times not every time I should say but many talk about what their business should be in the future should include those things uh, or answer those questions a lot of them don't but especially number four but that's uh, that's a good format to follow so with that said uh, a mission statement should focus on the customer need that the firm is going to satisfy and what they're going to need to do to satisfy that need and be specific so that the mission statement means something but perhaps not so specific that uh, it rules or leaves something out or someone out or some group out but it would be helpful if people could see it they know we read your mission statement they kind of know exactly what it is you do. So let's look at Ford, a fine American company. We are a global family with a proud heritage. So they're saying right now they're global and they've been in business for a while. They're passionate and committed to providing personal mobility for people around the world. So again, they hit on the global. They hit global twice. I'm going to guess that's important to them. And you notice they don't mention cars or trucks or tractors I say their personal mobility so they weren't they're not so specific that they list out everything they make so in that case they use a broader term personal mobility because they have Ford has a bunch of different product lines advanced auto parts is a little bit longer provide personal vehicle owners right so they're going to, they tell you they specialize in personal vehicle owners not fleet uh, fleet owners and enthusiasts so people just like to you know tune up their or tweak up their car or truck or whatever do things to it uh, vehicle related products they have other stuff Know, car wash, you know, liquid and stuff like that, and that their people know what they're looking for with knowledge to fill their wants and needs at the right price. So they throw price in there. Let you know they're not the most expensive, or they don't think they are. Our friendly, knowledgeable, and professional staff. That's a message to their employees that they've worked into the mission statement. Will help inspire. I, I don't know how that is. Educate and problem solve for our customers. So. That's advanced auto parts. So, so let's look at some characteristics of effective corporate mission statements. This slide breaks them down to functional and physical. So under the functional category, define the mission as to what the customer needs are to be satisfied, the functions the firm must perform. You saw it on an earlier slide. Can be too broad to provide clear guidance fails to take into account firm specific competencies so 
somehow the slide got jacked up rendering it over to this platform but broad would be we're in the transportation business well that could be uh, uber that could be a limousine service that could be megabus but more specifically if they write it more specifically in the functional category I said a long distance transportation for large volume producers of low value low density products okay they haul wood chips or something equally a low value low density if we go down to the physical part of the slide specify the domain in physical terms so you can see broadly uh, Norfolk Southern says they're in the railroad business more specifically they should say they're in the long haul coal carrying business right that lets you know if uh, I mean I'm sure they carry other things too but that's their specialty um, so you can see the differences in being too broad there's all, I mean the problems being too broad and there's also problems being too specific there's a there's a, there'd be an art and science to that with more than a few people involved with iterations going back and forth so that it makes sense and does what you want it to do now why do people have mission statements because they want to let their employees and their, their stakeholders and outside people potential consumers or users know in very short span of words what they're about and many times companies include messages about their values and their principles in there because it's it's proactive uh, rather than waiting for somebody to sue them because they did something wrong they said well it's right in our mission statement that we don't do that uh, so it's good to have if you if one of the social values of your company is uh, let's say it's Warby Parker the eyeglass company that when you buy glasses from Warby Parker they they give glasses to people that need glasses but can't afford them right you would want to work that in there or if your program is Bomba socks that uh, you know for every X amount of socks they sell they donate so many socks to uh, you know people who are currently homeless uh, then you would want to work that in there because you know you want people to know that's that's what you're about so it can help clarify things and reduce inconsistencies within the company and it also let people know what you're about what your social concerns or your principles are to the external business community so let's talk about objectives for the firm some components of an objective a performance dimension uh, we have we're going to measure whatever company has going to have several performance uh, dimensions which is the most important you know to you or to the firm or if you're drawn up to you that's important a measure of how you're going to evaluate the progress uh, is it going to be a percentage growth is it going to be a hard number like inventory turnover or a hard dollar figure sales or whatever it is if there's going to be a hurdle rate or a hurdle level or a target that you're going to hit you know you want to be we want to be in all of the southeastern states all the 13 southeastern states by the end of 2025 or whatever in a time frame if you don't put people always say you know deadlines uh, focus people's effort um, if you have goals or objectives you'd like to put a timeline on it that we're gonna accomplish this by this point in time so that people know what they're working toward a very commonly used uh, acronym that some people just really hate uh, I do not hate it for objectives is smart uh, that is specific it's an acronym 
it stands for specific, right? As specific as it can be, measurable. Can it be measured? And how are we going to measure it? Spell that out. Attainable. Remember, you don't want to make goals so hard nobody can attain them because that is demotivational. You also don't want them to be so easy that anybody can attain them, doing the very minimal. But you want them to be attainable. Relevant. Do they matter? Does this thing matter? Uh, you know, say it was a college or university uh, reducing, you know, dropouts. That might be a relevant measure, right? And time bound. Not that we're just going to be working on this all the time, but we're going to be working to hit this measurable objective uh, that means something to us by this time next year or the year after. So smart. Uh, and you've, I'm sure you've encountered that in other courses and uh, you'll probably encounter it again. So the purpose of a corporation that's publicly owned, even a private company that's privately owned, is to maximize shareholder value. Okay, There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that might not mean, you know, do, that doesn't mean by hook or by crook, do anything you can to make money, even if you have to lie, cheat, steal, and, uh, you know, slap people around. But obviously people are in business to, you know, make money and and making a profit is should be your number one primary goal because without that you can't do anything else but is it the only thing that matters to your company you know it might be but for most companies it's not it's a primary goal because if you don't make money then you can't stay in business then nobody has a job and you even if you want to uh, you know save the world as part of your corporate mission, you can't do it if you don't make money. Thus enters the concept of the balance scorecard. Think of it as, you know, our most important objective is to make money, to make a profit. But there's other important things for a business so they can run efficiently and effectively. We would like to, uh, not turn over our employees all the time, right? That might indicate that we're doing something wrong or not rewarding them properly or, or whatever. We also might want to, uh, you know, make sure we invest in research and development. Uh, so we might want to measure that. Might want to measure uh, how many customers we lose in a year uh, because that might indicate something else. So a balance scorecard is a lot of companies use those so in addition to just raw profits uh, we're going to measure you know 50 percent of we're going to measure that's going to that's going to um, be 50 percent of your annual review let's say and the other 50 percent might be divided up between three or four uh, other things one of which you know how well your manager thinks you're doing or whatever that's the concept of the balance scorecard. It's not only maximizing shareholder value. It's going to include other things as well. So from principles of marketing and, as I always say, probably another marketing course or even another management course or a strategy course that you've taken or will take, Portfolio models will come up and frequently the Boston Consulting Group growth share matrix, which is a useful tool for firms to use to look at their resource allocation and what they might want to do going forward. Let's say different product lines or different products. And if you remember from principles, you the BCG growth share matrix divides products or businesses and as question marks those are high growth industries with low relative market share stars a market leader in a high growth industry cash cows uh, products or companies that have a high uh, market share but they're in low growth markets but they have most of it 
and then dogs, uh, which they shouldn't use that title because dogs are great and dogs make everything better. Uh, those are low share businesses in low growth markets. So pictorially, you can find them all over the internet and you've in textbooks and you may have done one yourself. Chose Unilever here because I'm going to talk, that's going to come back up in a minute. But so we have market growth from you know low to high. I don't know why I made that a, an O. That should have been an L. And market share. Uh, just high to low. Reverse. So we can. Um, let me clear all that off of there. So we can, for Unilever, we have stars up here, question marks, which includes Lifebuoy Soap, which probably none of you have probably even heard of. Cash Cows, Lipton Tea. We've got Lifebuoy over here, too. That's the reason that was a very popular soap back in the days of my grandmother. Uh, and they still make and sell it, but they don't market it at all. Ponds, you can see. Soup mix, and then dogs over here. They've got clear and comfort, and whatever that is, and I don't even know what those are. So maybe they are dogs. But is it perfect? No. It's like a SWOT analysis, though. It forces you to think about things in categories. A SWOT analysis, obviously, strengths and weaknesses of the firm, and opportunities and threats. So you know, and within one of these categories. Uh, Lipton makes has several types of uh, tea. All right, they have different types of tea. They may also categorize as one of these four, with just within Lipton. So within Unilever, at the top, they're looking at all their brands, and it helps you to make decisions about, you know, where you're going to spend money in the future. Also, if you look at it and go, you know, we do have this and this. These brands might be able to work together, you know, in some sort of, some sort of synergy, which uh, we know is one plus one equals three. So, in other words, you and I together can do better and more than you and I apart. Uh, you know, and then groups can get so big where they, you may have learned that in group dynamics of management that they're just unwieldy, but that's that's what synergy is. So companies, when they're thinking about strategy and their objectives, they'll look for sources of synergy. Knowledge-based synergies, they look at the firm and go, you know, we have this knowledge and and this information in this part of the company, and they don't really work with this part of the company, but they sh they do similar things with similar types of data. I believe if we let them work together or ask them to, they could do better than either one of them alone. It also comes into effect when you're talking about branding or the identity of the company. If you've got a strong brand, in the marketplace that's regarded as a quality brand, it's well known. Uh, you may want to, as a good reputation, you may want to use that on different products. It has a great reputation here. Now you might want to not use Clorox, uh, the Clorox brand, in uh, for some green low phosphate detergent because Clorox. You know, people think of Clorox, they think of bleach. Uh, you may want to concentrate that on now, you know, uh, disinfecting wipes. That would be good. People think, yeah, Clorox that disinfects. Oh, they only make wipes. That's good. I have Value Jet and AirTran up here. Neither one of which are in business any longer. Uh, Value Jet voluntarily uh, got absorbed into AirTran, even though Value Jet uh, was much bigger than AirTran at the time. AirTran, a few years ago, was purchased by Southwest. And the reason is because a value jet, jet leaving Florida, 
uh, crashed shortly after takeoff, and that's what was left. They crashed into a swamp, and it turned out they were, I believe they were hauling, uh, they had some oxygen canisters or something. They 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 were flying somewhere else. They'd take them on as uh, freight, and they interacted with something and blew up, blew the plane out of the ground, and a whole family from Cartersville, Georgia, was uh, killed in that, in that wreck. So after that, Value Jet's name was quite tarnished. They said, you know, our best bet is to just become something else. So they uh, got in touch with Airtran. Airtran uh, took them over, uh, even though Airtran was much smaller. But that made Airtran much bigger and immediately changed the name on the Value Jet jets to Airtran. So it's just an example of as we start talking about, you know, uh, corporate branding and uh, looking for synergy, you know, if you if you were a company you owned ValueJet and Airtran both, you wouldn't say, well, let's uh, let's use that ValueJet logo in more places, uh, because after that crash, uh, the first perception everybody had in their mind was, I'm not getting on one of those, because it was very traumatic. So we're talking about corporate branding strategy. I'm asked to remember these three as we move on along through the next uh, three slides here at the end. Uh, we're talking about three options. You might use the brand name on all or most of the firm's products in all markets because you've got a very prestigious brand. You might want to use that. It gives credence to, you know, if you want to start up another type of business, you might give credibility to it. You might use a dual branding strategy where each offering you have carries the corporate name, but also an individual product name so that it, it's more specific as to what that line is or what that product is. Or you may not be interested in people knowing that uh, every product you have is owned by the same company, and that way you could avoid the value jet. Air trans situation. Some one of your products causes people's, uh, you know, faces to fall off. Then uh, it doesn't tarnish the the main corporate brand. So if we have these three strategies, let's look at a couple of examples and see which one applies. Let's look at Marriott and think which of those applies. And they go back. Top, middle, or bottom? Let's go with the middle one. Each offering carries a corporate identifier and an individual product name. That's the that's the strategy that Marriott has decided to use, right? Marriott has a a well-known brand name. Everybody knows it. So therefore, you have the Fairfield Inn by Marriott. And the JW Marriott, which people know that you know the Fairfield Inn is not like the JW Marriott. The Marriott's very high end; they're high end luxury part of their stable. And the Fairfield Inn is not. Whereas Residence Inn, in the case you know you might stay there if you're two weeks on a job, it's got a kitchen in it. So they follow the dual branding. Now let's look at another one. Unilever. Unilever owns everything from Hellman's to Ben and Jerry's. If you had me in class before, you know I like to point that out. To spaghetti sauce. So which strategy are they? Is Unilever using? I'm going to go with this one. Each product given a unique brand and identity. Right? So the Unilever name and logo appears on the back of a Hellman's jar of mayonnaise and axe body spray. But you have to turn it around to look. And most everything in everybody's bathroom and shower is uh, made by 
Unilever. So, how about this one? There's only one left. So let's see if it fits. You could make an argument for either of these, right? A corporate identifier, an individual product brand. Well, that's not true because FedEx uses, it's just text. So um, let's go with might serve as the corporate brand, brand name of most of the firm's products in all markets because FedEx uses, they will say FedEx home delivery. They do have a dog on that one. But it's just FedEx services, FedEx Express. They're using FedEx. They use different colors. Uh, but this is just text. It's not like uh, Unilever with completely, you know, different brands between Noxzema and Axe. Uh, so you can see those are just examples of uh, different branding strategies that companies uh, will use as they're pursuing their objectives in the marketplace. With that said, that wraps up that chapter, and uh, that is chapter two with a boring title, but not a boring subject, and I bid you adieu, and I will see you again.